Well, good morning to everyone, and our Lord is delighted that we are together in his house, that he may serve us with his gifts of life and salvation, and for us to join together in praise and thanksgiving for those gifts. We are following the divine service, uh, setting one, beginning on page 151 in our in the front part of our hymnal, page 151. Remembrance of our baptism, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Give us, yes, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our psalm for this uh, 24th Sunday after Pentecost is Psalm 70, which we will read responsively. You will find those verses uh, in the front part of the hymn prior to our order of service. Uh, Psalm 70. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them turn back because of their shame. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. But I am poor and needy. Hasten me. O oh God. And glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Continue with the Kyrie on page 152. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. with 
the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, send forth your Son to lead home his bride, the church that with all the company of the redeemed, we may finally enter into his eternal wedding feast. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for our readings. The lessons for the 24th Sunday after Pentecost comes from Amos chapter 5. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? Is it darkness and not light? As if a man fled from, fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? in gloom with no brightness in it. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs, to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle for today comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring him, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lambs and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lambs, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil with their lambs. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for themselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, 
for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let's join together and confess the faith. We will use the words of the Apostles' Creed, and you'll find them on page 159. We confess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day. We pray, may the words of my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, there is an insert in the bulletin, uh, which includes a text from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9, which is free from the readings that we have for this 24th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, But it is something for us to really behold as we await our Lord and as we approach the end of this church year and we anticipate the, the glory of the Lord that we will see on that last day. But here's that verse. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. 
but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. And this is our text. Please be seated. And there are some points on that insert with this meditation also to a a summary of our readings that we actually heard just moments ago uh, chosen for this Sunday of the church here. You can use that summary in your time of meditation, prayer throughout the week. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God's grace, his mercy, his peace be ours this morning through his son, Jesus. Amen. I'm, I think it's a, a sure thing, a fair number of us adults have some aches and pains, uh, some pesky injuries that we're dealing with on a day-to-day day basis, all because at some point during our adulthood, we try to relive our youth. I would say there's knee injuries because we try to run like a child, different pains in the back, all because we haven't kept up that youthful strength and flexibility. You know, but it really is true, though. There are these fantastic things about every season of life. And I have felt over the past few years, as personally, the 40s have been the best for me. But today I want to address the adults. I want to address the parents of this wonderful congregation And I want the youth among us to know that we are so glad that you are here. And I want the youth to hear this address to the adults and the parents of this congregation. Youth is a fantastically interesting time in life. It has its own unique, uh, peculiar challenges. Anyone going through them. And for anyone who's caring for the youth, raising them through those years, they face those same challenges. They are years incredibly lively and incredibly colorful in ways never again experienced once those years are past. Many of us adults are reminded of our youth years when we blow out that knee or strain muscles when we think we're 17 again, it's easy for any of us adults to say, well, if I were young again, if I could go back, I would do this, or I would not have done that at all. I want to share a very short poem with you. Of all the sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. Many of us adults regret over things of our youth of the past, And I want to make it clear, for as adults, you look back on your youth, if there are regrets, one thing is for sure, it was not God's fault. God tells us how to live out our youth, to live out our lives. For any of us with regrets, we have ourselves to blame for any sin and evil of our youth or any time of life. But if you are an adult you are dealing with regrets of your youth, or your regret, you have regrets of any time in your life. Look upon the cross of Jesus and hear the good news that our Lord extends his hand of grace and mercy and healing through the forgiveness of your sins that he offers you. And know of that certain peace with God that that forgiveness provides you. And that is where true healing begins. As we adults feel the pain in our knees, our backs, our shoulders, where we're reminded that our youth years are past, while we do that, let's behold something else, the gift of youth among us. And let's join together and encourage them in those lively, colorful years And let's show every bit of support that we can to their parents, their families. It pleases God for his family, his children, his people to do these things. And so let's go to the first point on the insert there. The Lord has provided joys for every time of life. He invites youth to enjoy their lively, colorful years. The devil is a liar. All he communicates is lies. 
I hate him. The devil paints God as the enemy of joy. He paints this picture of God as the enemy of happiness. As the enemy of the pleasures God intends us to enjoy. As if God is some kind of killjoy. Be assured the devil does all that he can to persuade our youth that God just begrudges their youthful happiness. The devil tells our youth that if they want to enjoy those lively, colorful years, it turns out that God is their enemy keeping them from it. That God hates it if they live out those exuberant years of youth. And we as adults need to be there for our youth and their parents in reminding them that these are all lies from the devil. We often hear such things and we often want to say things, well, young people want to have a good time. And yes, they do. And there is nothing wrong with that desire. And that desire is just as natural by God's created order for youth to enjoy those lively, colorful years just as much as it is for any of us to have a desire to breathe good air, eat healthy food, enjoy our relationships that God has given us. We remember Martin Luther. He was caught up in one of those lies of the devil, multiple lies, and he was caught up in a wretched deception. In his young days, he went off to the monastery, a life of forsaking the relationships that God had already given him in family, neighbors, to give all those up in this vain hope of actually getting closer to God while there. And they were, as Martin Luther would tell us, they were spent in in a gloomy atmosphere filled with wailing and cringing and misery of self-inflicted hunger and torture, all in the hopes that he could somehow earn at least a little bit of God's favor. But it was all in vain. And that is how he spent his youth. But yet there in those misery, in that misery, God was gracious to him and directed him. And there he was led to the scriptures. And there the Holy Spirit gave life in Christ to Luther to see that man is justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that set Martin on one exuberant course of true, happy service to God and to others. Martin Luther, when he discovered the gospel, It set him free with a freedom he did not expect, a freedom that is available only in Jesus Christ. Let's go to the second point there on the notes. Only as believers in Christ do we have reason to rejoice. Since we have peace with God through forgiveness of sins, we have freedom to enjoy life as God created us to. You know, in Christ we have a right relationship with God, and it's only through Christ that we can. And it's a relationship of true peace with God, a relationship with God who provides us true joys of every season of life, things of every stage of life that we get to rejoice in. And it is only in Christ that we get to rejoice in these things. Rejoice that every time we are brought to the realization of guilt, we as children of God know in the confidence of our baptism, we can approach his throne. Ask for forgiveness. Ask him to renew us, lead us once again in his ways. And there, for the sake of his precious son, God does just as we ask of him. He forgives us. He leads us to enjoy life in a way we wouldn't be able to otherwise. That's freedom. God is always available to hear our prayer of repentance, our confession, and to assure us, absolve us of our sin. He invites us, he pleads with us to go to him every day in repentance. And it is his joy to assure us of that forgiveness he provides us. And to never miss out on the opportunities to receive his grace, his means of grace, here in divine service every week. What he provides us from this chancel, from this altar, gives us a freedom that nothing else can. Freedom to live as God created us to live. 
and adults and parents, we must, we should, and we want to keep our youth with this very Lord. And by the very means the Lord has provided for that to happen, it is then in in that freedom that only Christ can provide, then our youth can truly rejoice, truly rejoice in their lively, colorful years. But while our Lord invites our youth, we also have to remember, the Lord invites our youth to enjoy those lively, colorful years. Our Lord also gives them a very, very clear, unmistakable warning as we as adults, as parents, as families, need to keep our youthful also, youth also mindful of this. Let me read to you the last portion of our text. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. In other words, the freedom we have in Christ to live out those joys and pleasures God created us to enjoy, that freedom is not a license. It is not a freedom to just do whatever it is you and I want to do. It is not, does not mean God permits us to enjoy and take pleasure in just anything, anyhow. He sets the boundaries for that enjoyment and those pleasures. Boundaries that if they are crossed, we become enslaved to sin and forfeit our freedom in Christ. And we become burdened with sin and guilt and with captivity to the devil once again. And when this happens with our youth, they become enslaved to their guilt. Then in order to enjoy their lively, colorful years any way possible, they feel that they have to hide from God the things that they are enjoying. And we do not want this for them. Let's go to the third point there, which has several smaller points. God invites youth to enjoy their years. However, he also adds a warning. This warning is necessary because in part A of that point, our nature is corrupt with sin. For every season of life, God has given us things to enjoy, to take pleasure in, all within these safe boundaries that he provides us. And God has articulated those boundaries for us with his Ten Commandments. However, because of our sinful natures, these things to enjoy cannot be entrusted to us sinners without God's warning. Pleasures in themselves, as God has given us to, to enjoy, are not evil. Our sinful natures and what we do with those pleasures because of our sinful natures is what turns up evil. And it is not the gifts that God gives our youth to enjoy. That's the problem. It is what our youth in their sinful nature are capable of sinfully doing with those gifts, that becomes our concern. And just as God gives all of us warning as his people, he does so for our youth as well. He gives us warnings because he loves us. We want our youth to know that that it is because God loves them so much that he gives them sufficient warning to not exercise their freedom in Christ beyond the boundaries his Ten Commandments allows them to. Let's continue on with part of the, the second part of the third point. This warning is necessary because we are surrounded by that same corruption. You know, it is so sad when we hear of youth having been taken advantage of by others in this world. It is, and sadly it does happen. It's terrible, it's tragic. And there are also so many who would tempt our youth into trouble, who would deceive them into giving up their gifts from God, who do not care about the pain or the despair that they might cause our youth just so that they can get something out of our youth. Yes, our youth are vulnerable. And what more, they themselves have sinful natures just as any of us do, of which can be tempted. 
And they can easily go beyond where God warns them not to go with their gifts of happiness into dangerous places and situations. And we want our youth to know that God's Ten Commandments are there as His loving boundaries to keep them safe and for them to truly enjoy life in that freedom that Christ has provided them to. They also teach our youth how to discern what they encounter in this world. To know and to be able to discern what they need to say no to and enable them to say no. And the third point, the third part of the third point there is this warning is necessary because the devil desires to trap and destroy our youth. How easily you and I as God's people forget 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Our Lord wants our youth and their parents to bear this ugly reality on their hearts and minds every day and not forget it, that the devil has his evil glare upon them. He is laser-focused and desperate to grab our youth, to tear them away from Jesus, to get them to forget the Lord, forget His Word, to forget His promise to them in their baptisms, and to walk away from the Lord chasing all kinds of fake, phony paradises beyond the loving boundaries God has set for them. And as God's people, we hate the devil But we love our Lord Jesus Christ. That he has given his life so that he may have our youth to be his own. To be their shepherd. And it is not a small gesture of love that Jesus gave our youth upon that cross. No, it was his life. It was his blood upon that agonizing cross of death. That was the payment for their sin yours too. And so let's all join together in adoration of our Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior who is also the kindest and wisest friend our youth can ever have. You know, in Genesis 36 and 37, we read the wonderful account of when Jacob gave his son Joseph a coat of many colors. It was a delight for Jacob to do this. And Joseph, a youth at the time, loved those colors. He loved them. Perhaps Jacob was aware of the lively, colorful years of his youthful son Joseph and knew such a robe of many colors would be very fitting for the years that he was experiencing. You know, that was a gift to Joseph, an earthly gift. But when we read 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 5, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. We want our youth to know that it is not the gifts that God has given them that is sinful. It is what their sinful natures can easily do with those gifts. We want our youth to know that God invites them to take refuge in their Savior, Jesus Christ, and to rejoice in the bright things of God's creation and in the liveliness of those years. We want our youth to know that God invites them to behold His Ten Commandments as an awesome thing, as His loving boundaries, when within those boundaries they may live out that freedom in Christ and true happiness. We want our youth to know that God invites them to His throne any time they have fallen into sin and to not run from God in shame, but to come to Him in the confidence that He calls them His own and confess there to their Heavenly Father their guilt before Him and remembering, remembering that God has already claimed them as His own and that He hears their voice and He knows their voice as they cry to him for mercy and ask for his forgiveness. He hears those voices, and he takes great joy in forgiving them their sins for the sake of his son, Jesus. Who Joseph, by the way, 
was a foretelling of. The very Jesus who once himself enjoyed those lively, colorful years of youth when he dwelt upon this earth. And so, yes, he lived upon this earth as their substitute, as well as all of ours, living that perfect, holy life expected of all of us that we can never reach. And after living that perfect, holy life, he still took upon us our sin and the sin of our youth upon himself, and he allowed it to crush him, that he might be that lamb to pay for your sins and the sins of our youth. We want our youth to be assured of that promise of God in holy baptism that his promise has not left them. And just as Jacob gave his son a robe of many colors, God, at the expense of his son Jesus, has given our youth a robe of pure white, a robe of Jesus' righteousness. If Jacob still could recognize the robe of colors that he gave his son after he had been dipped in the blood of a goat, most assuredly God can recognize the robes he has given each to us in holy baptism. A robe not dipped and stained in the blood of a goat, but a robe washed in the blood of a lamb and miraculously made pure white. We want our youth to know and to be sure how they stand before God as promised them in their baptism. Not a gentle reminder once in a while we get the chance, but for them to be reminded every day, for them not to to never come to the throne of God only when their sins are just bad enough, or when they're catching a break from the things in their lives, but regularly, weekly, come, behold, take hold of God's means of grace and divine service. We do not want our you to forget for one moment the grace of God in Christ Jesus, or to forget the very paradise God has promised them in heaven to look forward to. Yes, our youth do have sinful natures, All of us do. And they are surrounded in a world of people with that very same nature. To make things even more intense, the devil is that bent lion after our youth to destroy them. He hates them. We can be sure of that. We cannot let our youth out of our sight. and We do not want our youth to lose sight of God's means of grace for them. His very word, his very sacraments. For it is with these very means of grace by which the Lord keeps them strong. And it is these very means of grace by which God gives them the freedom in Christ to truly enjoy their robes of color of youth. All the while remembering the robe of Jesus' righteousness they already have. And so let's in the name of Christ support our youth. And support those in our congregation who serve our youth. We have terrific people dedicated to that. James and Alan, our Sunday school teachers, so many more. Teachers of Gulf Coast in a school that we support. Together with them, let's give every bit of support we can to families and parents. As parents carry out their roles as primary instructors in the Christian faith. As well as protectors and nurturers of our youth. God loves our youth, and he loves their families, and he loves all of us. The cross is far more than just a sign of his love. The cross is the very way God loved us in his son. And when we behold God's love in his son, let's be sure that we remember the Lord's answer to our question whenever we ask him, Lord, what is paradise to you? our Lord would most assuredly look at you and me and say, being with you, that is my paradise. And our youth need to be sure of this very same answer the Lord gives them when they ask that very same question, that they themselves are the Lord's paradise. Now our youth, our youth are not the future of the church. They are church now, along with each and every one of us. 
as the last point reads there. The devil only offers a fool's paradise. God offers a real everlasting paradise, all for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ. God bless us all. God bless our youth. All in the name of his son, Jesus. Amen. Would you please rise? Now may the peace of God, which passes all of our understanding, keep and guard our hearts and minds, and through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's join together and sing in the offertory. You'll find on page 159. Please be seated for our gathering of our offering to the Lord. Please rise for prayer. And let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, you are our help and deliverer. We bring to you the prayers and petitions of your people that you may grant us all things needful, guard against uh, us against all things harmful. Lord, in your mercy. Oh Lord, preserve your people from believing that You are pleased with us because of our works or ceremonies or what we offer you. Grant that what we do in worship and prayer may proclaim salvation in Christ Jesus alone. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you bestow favor and honor and withhold nothing from those who walk uprightly. We ask that you bless parents and those who teach your children in your ways, your word, and instruct them in the faith. The generations to come would love your promises and walk in your truth, dwell on your house. Grant cheer and happiness to those who enjoy their youthful years. Bless them with the freedom they have in Christ to serve you freely. Grant cheer and happiness to those who celebrate this week, whether it be birthdays, baptismal birthdays, anniversaries, or other wonderful times of life. Cheer their hearts and grant them that happiness according to your good measure. Lord, in your mercy. Righteous God, you despise corruption and you command justice. 
embolden our rulers and all in authority to enact and defend measures that preserve peace and provide justice for all. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, show mercy to those who cry aloud as they await your Son's coming in glory. Answer them with strength and healing, comfort and hope. Make them confident in Christ. We will raise his people on the last day. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, your Son will descend from heaven with a cry of command and raise those who have fallen asleep and deliver us to your kingdom of glory. Until that day, strengthen us by his body, his blood, his me- your very means of grace, and prepare us and keep us prepared for his coming in glory. Lord, in your mercy. And gracious Lord, grant that we may not grieve as those who have no hope, but to rejoice to encourage each other in the promise of the resurrection to life everlasting. We ask that you strengthen and comfort the family of Julie Myers as they grieve her death. Comfort them and all others who grieve in the promises of the resurrection and that you are now with them by way of your very word to comfort them and assure them of your mercy to them. Lord, in your mercy. God of our salvation, we know neither the day nor the hour of Christ's return, but we know that he has died and has risen again to open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Until that day, preserve us in faith, guard us from temptation. Do not let us be caught unprepared for his coming, but let us live our days in loving service and joyful expectation of the life of the world to come. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Top by our Lord and trust in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
Please be seated for just a few announcements. Uh, one, visitors and guests with us, uh, please know that uh, we are glad that you are here. On behalf of everyone here at Bethel, we want you to know that uh, please feel welcome to come at any time, make yourself known. And do we have anyone while we're together in the sanctuary uh, that would like to make themselves known, introduce themselves, or a guest that you have with us? All right, wonderful. Uh, in just a few moments, Bible study and Sunday school as well. But I also do have a request to um, a memorial service for Julie Myers will be held a week from tomorrow, um, the 20th. And an app, it has been asked that if, if you do plan to attend and the luncheon that follows, if you would please call the church office and give an RSVP so that way they can prepare uh, for, the, for the correct or accurate number of those um, attending. So if you could please do so. And that's all for announcements. Uh, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.